Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the course of survey of major English-speaking countries. This lecture is about the general introduction of Canada, part two. Canada is the second largest country in the world in terms of land mass, yet it ranks only 35th in terms of population, with only about 38 million. Canada's population density is roughly four people per square kilometer. But this statistic is misleading because most parts of Canada are sparsely inhabited. Owing to the country's geographic and climate situation, the majority of the Canadian population is mainly concentrated along the southern border with the United States, an area that constitutes only about one-tenth of Canadians' land mass. Thousand years before the first European explorer discovered it, this land that would one day become known as Canada was populated by tribes of Aboriginal people. This people used to be called Indians. It is said that when Christopher Columbus discovered America, he thought he had arrived in India and thus accidentally misidentified the native population as being Indian. Since the 1980s, the native Canadians have been officially referred to as the First Nations. First, because they are the original inhabitants of the country and the nations, because there is not one single group or culture. There are many nations or tribes which have different languages, customs, and beliefs. The First Nations is not a comprehensive term for all Aboriginal peoples of Canada, and it doesn't include non-Indian peoples such as the Inuit or the Metis. The term Indian was discarded because it didn't reflect the rich cultural diversity and the contributions of these peoples. The First Nations now make up about 3.8% of the Canadian population, and their numbers are increasing due to high birth rates. The languages, beliefs, customs, and activities of the First Nations varied according to where they lived. The lifestyle of the people who inhabited Canada's coasts dependent on fishing and hunting. Those who lived on their prairies were nomads that hunted herbs of buffaloes, which provided them with food, clothing, and tools. And in central and eastern Canada, the First Nations grew crops as well as hunted. In addition to the First Nations, Canada's constitution officially recognizes two other special groups of Aboriginal peoples. The Far North are the Inuits, also called Eskimo, a group who adapted to the harsh conditions of the Arctic climate by hunting whales, seals, caribou, and polar bears. Today, some of these people still live this way. Others can now make a living through selling their carvings and handicrafts, which are prized by collectors for their beauty. The final group is the Metis, who emerged when French fur traders married Indian women. In appearance and in lifestyle, their children inherited characters from both their European and Aboriginal backgrounds. And this close involvement in the fur trade makes their economic development different from other Aboriginal peoples. For these reasons, it was decided that the Metis constituted an Aboriginal people different from the other two groups. Canada's Aboriginal peoples were vital to the fur trade and thus played a huge role in Canada's economic development. But they were treated 
very badly by their white European who came to colonize Canada. Native peoples were coerced into signing treaties, which allowed settlers to take over their land, and they had been treated as second-class Canadians for centuries. They were forced to live on reserves. And until 1961, they were forbidden to vote or consume alcohol. They are a sector of Canadian society that remains discriminated against today. While in recent years, their situation has improved and they have become more politically and economically active. Aboriginal peoples are still, as a group, Canada's poorest immigrants. Their income is less than half the Canadian average. Their life expectancy is 10 years lower than the Canadian average. Their infant mortality rate twice as high. They are vulnerable to diseases. International organizations such as the United Nations have criticized the Canadian government's systematic discrimination against its native population. Nowadays, most Canadians agree that the Aboriginal peoples have been treated badly for far too long and that it is time for a change. Canada is an immigration country, and immigration has played and continues to play a key role in shaping the character of Canadian society. However, before the Second World War, Canada used to have a racist immigration policy, which actively discriminated against the racial and the religious minorities. It was after the Second World War that the Canadian government began to adopt a new policy, the point system to eliminate prejudice. People migrate to Canada for different purposes. Some came to Canada as skilled workers and wished to get a Canadian work permit. Others may be interested in migration to Canada as investors or entrepreneurs. Whatever the purpose, applicants are required to pass the point system that a citizenship and immigration Canada sets. For historical reasons, the Canadian population is mainly characterized by its linguistic duality, with English and French being the two predominant languages. However, Canada is becoming a multicultural society. While most Canadians still speak English or French at home, nearly one-fifth of the people are reported to have a mother tongue other than English or French. The most common mother tongues reported include Chinese, Italian, German, and Aboriginal languages, among which Chinese has become the third most common mother tongue in Canada. Canada is recognized as a multicultural nation in the wakes of its diversified ethnic groups. Among the Canadian population, there are more than 30 ethnic groups, and many of these ethnic groups kept their own distinctive cultural characteristics. Many factors have influenced the introduction of multicultural policy in Canada. The 1960s was marked by the increasing troubled English-French relations. A royal commission was set up to examine and recommend solutions to the outstanding problems. Organized ethnic communities demanded that their heritage also be acknowledged and argue that the old policy of assimilation was both unjust and a failure. In addition, the commissioners found that one third of Canadians were neither English nor French. In its final report, 
the Royal Commission recommended the Canadian government to acknowledge the value of cultural pluralism in the policies and the programs. This new model of citizen participation unlike the model of the United States, which encouraging citizens to be absorbed in the so-called melting pot, promotes a cultural mosaic in which people of diverse origins and communities are free to preserve and enhance their own cultural heritage while participating as equal partners in Canadian society. In 1971, the Government of Canada implemented a multicultural policy to recognize that pluralism was a fact of Canadian life. In 1988, the Canadian Multiculturalism Act was passed. Canada became the first country in the world to pass a national multiculturalism law. As a result, the diversity of ethnicity, coupled with the government's multiculturalism policy, led to the emergence of multicultural Canada. With globalization and the ever-increasing movement of people from one country to another, Canada's future depends on all its citizens committing to a unified Canadian identity while still taking pride in the uniqueness of their own individual heritage. The multilingualism and multiculturalism together constitute a distinctly identifiable Canadian culture. As for education, it is compulsory in Canada. That is, children from 6 to 16 are required by law to attend school. Public education is free to all citizens and permanent residents up to the end of secondary school. For parents seeking a better education for their children, they can send to a private school instead of a public school. Overall, being comprehensive, diversified and available to everyone, coupled with considerable financial commitment towards education, Canadian education system reflects the government's belief in the importance of education. In Canada, 10 provinces and three territories are responsible for elementary, secondary and university education, which means there are significant differences between the educational systems of different provinces and territories. As a result, Canada has no national or federal department of education. For each provincial system, while similar to others, bear some characteristics with respect to particular history and cultures. However, the standards across the country are uniformly high. By law, children must attend school until the age of 15 or 16 depending on where they live. Children begin their education in elementary school at the age of six or seven. Elementary schools usually start with kindergarten for little children, but it may vary from school to school or from province to province. For example, some provinces do not offer kindergarten in their educational system. Elementary school runs through to grade 6 to 8 and is followed by secondary school or high school. In some provinces, high schools is divided into junior high and a senior high. Students must complete high school to be admitted to college or university. Canada has a large selection of universities and colleges located in both urban and rural settings in every region of the country. These universities are internationally known for the quality of teaching and the research. Students do not have to pass a university entrance examination. 
but they do need to achieve a minimum level in their final exams at secondary school in order to enter the university. To qualify for a degree program at most English-speaking universities, students for whom English is not their first language must pass an English examination test. The TOEFL and the Canadian Academic English Language Assessment are commonly accepted. But Canadian universities often have their own tests for students or may accept other English tests such as IELTS. Laval University, originally founded in 1663, is the eldest French-speaking university in Canada, with its main campus located in Quebec City. The University of Toronto, established in 1827, is now the largest university in the country. Four prime ministers, two governor general, and numerous international recognized academic and business leaders graduated from this institution. It also boosts most Nobel Prize winning graduates among all the universities in the country. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.